Hello and welcome back to another full step-by-step -step PC build guide and today I'm going to be showing you how to build a PC in the brand new 011 Dynamic Evo RGB from Lian Li. Lee. So Lian Li Lee have really improved the 011 Dynamic Evo case. They've added a few new modern features to the case but the big selling point is the additional light strips at the top and at the bottom which should definitely guarantee you a few extra frames per second. So in this video I'm going to be taking a really detailed look at this case, pointing out all its features to you and giving you a real step-by-step -step guide to putting all the parts I've got in front of me together today and coming up with a fully working PC by the end of the video. So let's start by taking a look at the parts I'm going to be building with today. For the motherboard I'm going to be using the ASUS ROG Strix X670E eGaming Wi-Fi. For the CPU I'm going to be using AMD's 7800X 3D. Keeping our CPU cool I've got a 360mm AIO from Lian Li. It's their Galahad 2 Trinity Performance. For RAM, I've got 32GB of Team Group's T-Force Delta RGB DDR5 at 6000 mega transfers per second. For storage, I'm going with a single Gen 5 NVMe drive from Adana. It's their Legend 970 in 1TB capacity. Powering the whole build, I've got a fully modular Titanium ATX 3.0 power supply from Fantex. It's their Revolt 1000. And I'm also going to be using their Revolt cable kit in black. For the graphics card, I'm going to be using the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 4080. And finally, for case fans, I'm really excited to be checking out Lian Li's brand new Unifan TLCD fans, which actually have a screen on the fans themselves. And for places where we don't need to see the screen, I'm going to be using their Unifan TL120 fans. And these come in a mixture of standard and reverse blade design. So some really cool parts, really looking forward to putting this PC together today. But before we get into that, let's make a start by taking a closer look at the case. To remove our tempered glass side panel, there's a little notch you can get your hand in at the back. We can then tilt the panel out lift up and away. So once you remove the side panel you are able to get your hands in here at the front and the front panel can simply be pulled out, lifted up and away. Our other side panel is removed in a similar way to the tempered glass panel. There's a notch here at the top you can get your thumb into. You're able to pull the panel out then lift up and away. Take a look at the back of the panel we've just removed. You notice we've got two large areas of perforation. These are for fans or radiators that you can mount at the side and also for your power supply to provide ventilation for it. You can see there's no additional dust filters and Lee and Lee are going with just mesh on the case. To remove our case's top mesh panel, we've got two captive thumb screws at the back which we need to loosen. Once it's been loosened, we can pull the panel backwards, lift up and away. And again, taking a look at the back of the panel we've just removed, you'll notice there's no additional dust filters. Our case's one and only dust filter is down at the bottom, and Lee and Lee have improved this dust filter from the original O11 Dynamic Evo by giving it a plastic frame. And this was a problem with the original O11 Dynamic Evo. This dust filter kept falling off in the particular unit that I have, so this looks to be a good improvement. It's magnetically attached, and all you need to do is simply pull it out and remove it. So with the panels removed, you can see our two ARGB lighting bars that give this case its name. So they go all the way along the length of the top and again all the way along the length of the bottom as well. And you're going to get full control over these lighting strips with some buttons on the side. So we've got a mode button here and there's an up and down button to be able to cycle through the various modes. We've got a color button to change the color and we've got a brightness button to cycle through the brightness. And I'll be showing you how these buttons work towards the end of the video. Um, we've also got a reset button and a power button. And you'll see our power button wraps around the front of the case, meaning you can either press it from the side or from the front. You'll see that our I.O. is down at the front of the case, so we've got a combined headphone and microphone jack, two USB Type-A ports and a single Type-C port. And just like the original 11 Dynamic Evo, it is possible to move the I.O. module to either side of the case. So you can see there's mounting holes here and here, and these are the locations we can move the I.O. module to. To free the I.O. module up, there's a little clip here we need to pull up, and then we can simply push the I.O. module up to free it. To reach the top, we're probably going to have to pull a little bit of extra cable through, and then we can just line it up at the top. And once we're happy it's lined up, we can push it forward, and it's going to clip into place, and then you can just a bit a matter of tidying up the cables. So that's what it's going to look like on the left side of the case. And if we want to move it over to the right hand side of the case, we're actually going to have to free this little clip up. It's held on with a screw here. We can then free up the I.O. module, and then I'm just going to rotate it round, line it up with the clips on this side, and push into place. And there's a little screw hole here, so we just need to slide the clip along. I need to push a bit of extra cable back in towards the case, and then we can screw the clip back into place with a screw. And that's what the I.O. module is going to look like on the left side of the case. 
So it is also possible to add an additional I.O. module, which Lee and Lee offer as an optional extra, meaning you're going to be able to install it in two out of the three mounting locations. So out of the box, the V2 version of the additional I.O. module is designed to be used in the original Lee and Lee O11 Dynamic Evo. And to use it in the RGB version, you're going to need to change the back plate, which actually clips it on to the case. So it's held on with four screws. So we should then be able to pull the back plate off. And we get this additional back plate in the box, and it's just a matter of lining it up and pushing it into place. So you can see I've moved the IO module that comes with the case back to the front, and I think I'm going to install this one on the right side of the case. So installing this exactly the same way as I've already shown you, just line it up with the slots and push it into place. So although the additional IO module does come with another clip and screw, and there does look like a hole here that you're going to be able to simply slot it into. And that looks like a nice route of routing it to this cutout here. If you do this, the dust filter is going to get in the way. And this clip here is really if you're going to be inverting the case to reverse mode. So if you do install the I.O. module down here, you are going to use the additional clip here to secure the cables before routing it back into the hole. But what Leanne Lee recommend if you're using these two clips is you just use this one clip at the bottom to manage both cables. So the open side of the clip is down at the bottom. So I'm just going to route these cables under here and then we'll get them clipped in here at the bottom. So just about able to get them fit in. Space is quite tight, but with a bit of a squeeze, they will go in. And then all we're going to need to do is feed the cables through to the second compartment. And we should now be able to slide our dust filter back into place. We'll just need to lift these cables up temporarily. And there we go. So if you are thinking about adding the additional I.O. module, one thing to take care of is that your motherboard is actually going to have the ports to accommodate it. For the additional two USB Type-A ports, you're going to need to have an additional USB 3.0 header on your motherboard. Remember, the I.O. ports at the front are going to be taking up one header on your motherboard. For the Type-C port to work, again, it's another USB Type-C internal header for it to work. And while most sort of modern, mid to high range motherboards will now start to have two of the ports allowing you to get all four of your USB Type-A ports working. There's very few motherboards that have two internal Type-C ports, so that might be the only limitation with doing this. So another improvement over the original O11 Dynamic Evo is the ability to remove this front pillar. It's held on with two screws at the top and two at the bottom. And then with all four of the screws removed, the pillar can simply be lifted away. So I am applying quite a bit of pressure on the top of the case and there doesn't seem to be any flex in it. It seems lovely and sturdy. So I don't think I've any worries about removing this front pillar. So in terms of fan support at the bottom, the top and the side, it's up to three 120 or three 140 millimeter fans. While at the rear of the case, it's up to a 120 millimeter fan. In terms of radiator support at both the bottom and the side, it's up to a 360 or 280 millimeter radiator. While at the top of the case, you can fit up to a 360 or 420 millimeter radiator. Like the original 11 Dynamic Evo, there is an optional mesh front panel kit. It comes in two brackets, which you're going to fix on to the front of the case, and then you get a mesh panel. The advantage of doing this is it is going to open you up to fan mounting slots at the front of the case. And on the bracket, you're going to be able to mount up to three 120 or three 140 millimeter fans, or up to two 160 millimeter fans. Unfortunately, I don't have this kit to show you. Mounting your fans and radiators should be straightforward with removable fan stroke radiator brackets at the bottom, on the side, and at the top. The one at the bottom is held on with this thumb screw. Then with the thumb screw removed, we're going to be able to slide the bracket towards the front of the case, tilt it out, and lift away. So another improvement they only have made to this version of the case is that you don't actually need to remove the top fan stroke radiator bracket to install fans and radiators at the top. In the original version, the Overlevin Dynamic Evo, there was no access to the holes, so you had to actually remove the bracket and install your radiator and fans outside the case before slotting it back. And while some people like to do this, not everybody does. So you can see here, there's no obstruction at all to the mounting slots at the top of the case with the bracket in the case. If you do want to move it, there's two screws here you need to remove. So with the screws removed, we're going to be able to tilt the bracket up and then lift out and away. If you do want to get the best possible cooling from the case and mount a 420mm radiator at the top, you're going to need to leave this bracket in place. Then in the case accessory box, you get these two brackets and you're going to fix them to your radiator using the radiator screws that come with your AIO. Now, in terms of the brackets, the open side you're going to want to have facing either side of the case. And although these brackets do look very similar, they're not. They're slightly different. 
This one, which is going to go towards the motherboard side of the case, actually has little notches, and they're going to clip on to the bracket at the top. Then you're going to set your radiator into place from the inside of the case, and the little notches that we were talking about are going to get passed through the top bracket, help holding your radiator in place, and then you're going to be able just to support it from the front. And then you're going to use eight of the screws that come in the case accessory box labelled N to secure the bracket into place. And then if the holes in the back aren't lining up perfectly, it's just a little push to bring them into place. So that's what it looks like with a 420mm radiator mounted at the top. The one thing you'll notice using these additional brackets, the radiator is going to be installed down lower in the case and it actually drops the radiator down about 20 millimeters. So when I talk about the clearances that you're going to get with the different motherboard modes, just be aware that using a 420 at the top, your clearance at the top is going to be reduced down by 20 millimeters. So you can see as well as mounting fans and radiators on the side of the case, we can also mount hard drives and SSDs and that's why these panels are in place. To remove the panels, we've got two little clips on the side, so it's just a matter of pulling the little clips in and then the panels can be tilted out and lifted away. So with the bracket in its default position, we've got 83.2 millimeters of space for fans and radiators in the main compartment. And you'll see in this position, we've got 30 millimeters of space in the second compartment. So it is possible to turn the bracket round. There's a lever here we just need to push up. We're going to be able to slide the bracket in, flip it round, and slot it back into place. So you'll see the bracket is now flush with the second compartment, and there's no space in the second compartment at all now. And you'll see the space in the main compartment has increased and it's up to 113.7 millimeters for your fan and radiator combinations. So if you take a closer look at the bracket, you'll notice we've got three slots on one side and two on the other, and that is also reversible. So we can flip our bracket up and rather than turn it around this way, we're gonna flip it around on its vertical axis and slot it back into place. And you'll notice we've now got the three slots over this side and the two at this side. So there's four different positions you can install the bracket in to accommodate the hardware that you want. So the case is compatible with motherboards up to EATX in size. Now you want to go with a CPU cooler. The maximum height supported is 167 millimeters. So in terms of installing your motherboard, there is two different height options that you can install it in. And we take a look at the standoffs at the back of the case. You'll notice that we have got two arrows. There's a down arrow, which the standoffs are secured at, but there's also an up arrow just above it. And that's the two different height options you have for your motherboard. You can install it in the low position, which it comes by default out of the box. Or if you move all the standoffs up to the high position, that's going to install your motherboard in the high position. So in the case accessory box, you get the standoff insertion and removal tool, which you simply pop over your standoffs. You can then get a screwdriver over the top. Use that to remove the standoff. Take the standoff up to the high position and pop it into place. And then it would just be a matter of repeating that for the other eight standoffs. So obviously if you move all these standoffs up, your motherboard is actually going to be moved up as well. Lee and Lee have thought of this. In the low position, there's a space at the top of the motherboard, which is covered by this plastic clip. So to move this little bracket, there's little clips on each side, so it's just a matter of freeing them up. We're then going to want to rotate the bracket around 180 degrees, slide it down to the bottom, and push into place. And this means our motherboard I.O. is now going to line up with the cutout with the motherboard installed in the high position. So the reason you might want to move your motherboard up is to make more space at the bottom of the case. So out of the box, the case comes installed in low mode where you have 25 millimeters of space at the bottom and moving it up to high mode, moving your motherboard up means you've got 45.3 millimeters of space at the bottom. That is going to come at a cost to space at the top of the case. Out of the box in the low mode, you've got 103.5 millimeters at the top of the case. But in moving your motherboard up, that is going to reduce the space at the top down to 83.2 millimeters. In terms of graphics card support, at the rear of the case, we've got seven horizontal PCI expansion slot brackets. And in terms of graphics card support, the maximum length supported is 455.7 millimeters and up to a maximum width of 169 millimeters. So you have a few different options for mounting your graphics card in this case. You can, of course, mount it in the traditional horizontal position. You can mount it vertically, or you can mount it in the upright position. If you go with the horizontal position, your graphics card is going to be really well supported as Lee and Lee include a GPU support bracket with the case. So the technique for installing your GPU support bracket varies depending on whether you're using an ATX or EATX motherboard. So I'll show you first of all how to install it with an ATX motherboard. So after installing your motherboard, you're going to go ahead and secure it with the screws. 
but you're not going to use screws for these two standoffs. In the GPU support bracket kit, you get these long standoffs, and they're going to simply screw through the motherboard and into the standoffs beneath. And this bottom one is a little bit of stiff to screw in, so you can use the standoff insertion and removal tool to secure it into place. Just tighten this one up as well. Then we can set our GPU support bracket into place, and there's little protrusions on the standoffs, and it's just a matter of lining these up with the holes, and then it's going to slot through. And then we're going to secure it into place with two screws that come in the box. Then we've got this little bracket we're going to slot over the top and secure it again with the same screw. And then we can stick a rubber pad onto the top of the bracket. So it's this little bit here is where your GPU is going to be resting down in. And to adjust it here, it's just a matter of pushing in here, and then you're going to be able to slide it up to where it provides support to your graphics card. And again, when you release this, it's going to lock into place. If you're going with an EITX motherboard, you're going to need to use this bracket. And then you're going to take this other bracket on and set it up to the outer holes. You'll see the bottom bit of metal goes through this hole here, and we've got a screw hole at the top. And then we're going to use, want to use one of the small screws that comes in the GPU support bracket box to secure the bracket into place. We're then going to do exactly the same thing at the bottom of the bracket. We're going to set the smaller bracket into place. And then if we turn it round, you'll see the little bit of metal has gone through the hole, and we've got a screw hole at the bottom. And then if we take another one of these small screws, and secure it into place. So this time we're going to set the bracket into place before setting our motherboard into place, and we're just going to push it all the way to the back of the case. So I might just temporarily need to move those rubber grommets a little bit to get it into place. I'm just going to slide it up between the rubber grommets. I'm going to slide this one so that gets it all the way to the back of the case. We've then got these little spacers which go over the top. And then you're going to install your motherboard over the top of this and just secure the screw through the motherboard and into the standoff behind it. Then you're going to be able to line the GPU support bracket up with this bracket here and using the screws that come in the box with the GPU support bracket to secure it into place. So because with an EITX motherboard, it's going to extend past these holes here over to here. This just allows you to still use the GPU support bracket. And again, it's exactly the same way to move it up and down, push the button in and slide it up to where it supports your graphics card. And obviously you're going to need to assemble this little T-shaped bracket onto here, just the same way I showed you with the ATX bracket. So the case is compatible with Leon Lee's Universal 4 slot vertical GPU kit. And the first step in installing it is to remove the top six PCI expansion slot covers. And then all you need to do is slide the vertical bracket into place and secure it into place with the thumb screws we've just removed. So for this build, I had actually been planning to install my graphics card in the vertical position. In previous builds, I've installed it horizontal and upright, and I thought today would be a perfect chance to show you it vertically. But you can see my problem here. I do love black and white themed builds, but even for me, this has taken it too far. And Lee and Lee have sent me the white bracket with the black case. So unfortunately today, we're not going to be able to show you this in the build. In terms of the bracket, it does come with a Gen 4 riser cable, so all you need to do is move the plastic protection from here. You're obviously going to install your motherboard first and get all your cables plugged in because it is going to block all the ports, and then you're going to be able to plug this into your motherboard. We're going to make sure the clip on the bracket is open, and then we can line our graphics card up with the slot and apply a little bit of firm pressure to get the GPU to clip into place. And then we'll secure the GPU into place with two of the thumb screws we've just removed. Lee and Lee also include two spur expansion slot brackets, which if we want, we can slide into place. And then there's a little thumb screw included as well to secure it into place. So you might find it a little bit easier to secure these brackets at the start before putting your graphics card into place. There is an additional bracket and thumb screw available if you wanted to fill in this second one in from the tempered glass panel. Our Strix card is so wide it's covering this slot, so there's no reason to put it into place. The only other issue you might have is in terms of shortage of thumb screws if you did want to use both of these brackets. The reason for that is you remove six thumb screws and six PCI expansion slot brackets from your case, but you need to use five of the thumb screws to secure the bracket to the case. So that only leaves you one spare thumb screw from your case to mount your graphics card to the bracket. And in general, you're going to need two of them. So you are going to have to use one of the additional thumb screws that comes with the GPU support bracket to mount your graphics card to the case, meaning that you're only going to have one spare thumb screw to secure one of these brackets. If you did want to use both and secure your graphics card, you'd have to find yourself an additional thumb screw.
So if you are planning to install your graphics card in the vertical position, make sure you install your graphics card before you install a rear fan. Because with the rear fan in place, getting your screwdriver down to screw the graphics card in is going to be a lot more difficult. So our GPU is reasonably secure here, installed in the vertical position. It's just a bit of a pity with the colour mismatch because I think our Strix card looks best in this orientation. Um, so, but fortunately this case does have lots of other options for mounting your graphics card. So we want to install our graphics card vertically. The first thing we're going to need to do is assemble our bracket. So what we're going to do is bring this bracket up to here and you'll see the holes at the top are going to line up. And then we're going to use the smallest screws that come with the vertical GPU kit to secure the bracket together. Next we need to separate the bit that's going to go onto our graphics card from the rest of the bracket. It's held on with two screws. And now that that's separated, we're going to be able to split the bracket apart. This bit's going to go into our graphics card and this bit we're going to mount to our case. Then we can go ahead and set our GPU onto the bracket, just passing through the slots at the bottom and then tilting it up into place. And in terms of the slots that we're going to want to use, it's the ones closest to where the bracket is going to go onto the side fan stroke radiator bracket. And then we're going to use two of the screws to secure the GPU to the bracket. And then we're going to need to assemble the bracket to support our GPU at the other end. If you've installed your GPU in the first slot, you're going to set the bracket on this way here. If you've installed it in the second slot, you're simply going to turn this bit round and screw it in here. And then I've got one of the little rubber pads I'm just going to set onto the bracket to help protect our GPU. So next we need to set this bracket into place at the bottom of the case and this is what's going to help support our GPU bracket. Now you are going to want to size your graphics card up in the case, so you're obviously going to want to have this in a position where it supports your graphics card. If you've got a small graphics card installing it down here is not going to work. And the other place you're going to want to be careful with is the power connectors on your graphics card. So you're definitely going to want to size things up. And you're going to want to have this providing a reasonable amount of support to your graphics card. And that's going to depend on the width of your GPU. And Lee and Lee have a little diagram in the manual that comes with the upright GPU kit that tells you which of these holes to use. On the back of here, we've got some holes on the bracket. So for my particular graphics card, I'm going to secure it using the middle hole in the outer slot. If you are planning on installing fans behind the upright GPU bracket, set them in from the case's second compartment and screw them in from the main compartment. So just before we set our GPU into the case, I'm going to bring our HDMI cable through this cutout at the back. and plug it in to our graphics card. Just going to flatten it down a little bit and then line our graphics card up with the bracket and then slide it into place at the top. And then we'll secure the bracket into place at the top with the two screws we removed earlier on. We're going to use this little metal bracket to secure our GPU in into place at the bottom. So I've got another little rubber pad I'm just going to stick onto this side of the bracket. And then I can slide the bracket into place here. And then we're just going to slide the bracket to where it's providing support to the graphics card. And then we'll screw it into place. And then we're just going to bring our riser cable throughout through the rubber grommet here. We're going to line it up with the graphics card and push into place. And then we'll just cover the little lever to secure the GPU in place. So you'll see the vertical bracket is doing a great job of holding our graphics card in place. So you can see now the only GPU cable I haven't plugged in is our 12 volt high power cable. What I would recommend doing is plugging this in at the start before you actually install the graphics card into the case. And what you're then going to do is route the cable down the front and then pass it under the front fan bracket into the second compartment. In our second compartment we're then going to be able to pass our HDMI cable through here. If we open this door up we're going to be able to pull it all the way through. And obviously we did have fans installed there, we would need to route it up and round the side of the fans. We're going to be able to route it up the back and at the top of the case we've got a little rubber grommet. We're able to pull our HDMI cable out through. And that's what it's going to look like coming out the back. Our riser cable we're going to pass through this rubber grommet at the bottom through to the main compartment of the case. And then we can use some cable ties to help organise this at the back. And our riser cable then we're going to be able to plug into the top PCIe slot on our motherboard. So now that I've removed the GPU, I'm just noticing there's a little cutout here and this would be a much better place to route your HDMI or DisplayPort cable through because it's going to be going directly from your graphics card through to the second compartment without getting in the way of any fans that you're going to have installed behind the graphics card. Just before we move into our case's second compartment, I wanted to point out that we've got rubber grommets on all the cutouts surrounding the motherboard. 
Moving into our case's second compartment, and we've got this magnetically attached cable cover door. You just pull it open at this side to free it up from the magnetic attachments here. And on the back of this cable cover door, we're going to be able to mount up to two, two and a half inch drives. To mount the drives, you're going to take one of these little rubber pads and pass one of the smaller two and a half inch drive screws through the pad. And then you're going to secure that onto each corner of your two and a half inch drive. Then all you're going to do is take your two and a half inch drive, slot the little rubber pads through the holes and push the drive over to lock it into place. And you're going to be able to install one drive at the top and one drive at the bottom of this cable cover bracket and then close the door and that's what it's going to look like from the other side. These are the brackets we removed from the side fan stroke radiator bracket and if you don't want to have fans in a radiator side you're actually able to keep these on and mount drives on them. And on each of these brackets you're able to mount up to two two and a half inch drives or one three and a half inch drive. So the first thing to do in mounting the drives is to push rubber pads through the holes that you're actually going to be securing your drives to. So you're just going to line your drives up and decide which holes you're going to use. Then we can set our drives into place, turn the brackets over, and then we're going to use these screws to secure the drives to the bracket. The ones with the thicker end are for three and a half inch drives, the ones with the thinner ends are for two and a half inch drives. Then we can simply slot the drives onto the side bracket. So you can see we've got a little cutout here, so all the I.O. from the drives is going to be able to pass through here to our power supply and then on through to our motherboard. The other place we can mount drives is in the two individually removable hard drive cages at the back of the case. To remove each of the hard drive cages we need to remove the thumb screw at the back from the drive cage that we want to remove. And then to remove the hard drive cage it's just a matter of lifting it up to the middle and it can be pulled out. And then same thing for our second drive cage. So each of these hard drive cages can accommodate either a three and a half inch or two and a half inch drive. Out of the box it's set up for a three and a half inch drive. You can see the little rubber pads have been pushed into place. You're going to set your three and a half inch drive into the tray and then you're going to use the same screws we used over on the side fan bracket to secure the three and a half inch drive into the tray. If you do want to go with a two and a half inch drive, you can see there's additional holes here. There's no rubber pads on them there for your two and a half inch drive. Set it into the drive cage, and then you're going to use the same screws you're going to use to secure the motherboard to the case to secure the two and a half inch drive into place. Cable management in the case looks to be excellent. We've got Velcro cable straps at the top, at the bottom, and at the top and bottom of the central raceway. And we've got these metal cable clips that Leon and Dave used in some of their other cases in the middle of this raceway. To remove the clip, it's just a matter of pushing it to the side and you'll see then it's got little rubber grommets on it holding it into place. And you've got two different positions you can install it in, so we want to move it down to the lower position we can push it into place and move it into here. So the idea behind this is you're going to be able to put your larger power supply cables hidden behind this metal bracket and you've got another Velcro cable strap on the front to manage smaller cables like your fan or case cables. So taking a look at our case cables, coming from our front I.O. module, we've got our HD audio cable, our USB 3.0 cable, and our front panel Type-C cable. We've got all our front panel connectors organized into a single header. And then coming from our case's built-in ARGB controller, we've got a 3-pin 5-volt ARGB cable, which we plug into your motherboard, will allow it to sync up with our motherboard, and a SATA power cable, which we need to plug into our power supply. Otherwise, our case's ARGB controller isn't going to work. Our power supply is going to go down at the bottom of the case. There's a little bracket here it's going to rest on. And the case is compatible with full-size ATX power supplies up to a maximum length of 220 millimeters. You'll notice that our power supply bracket protrudes from the back of the case by 15 millimeters. And this is to improve your power supply compatibility as well, meaning your power supply doesn't go as far into the middle of the case where it's not going to interfere with your cables. And you'll notice our hard drive cage has a very similar arrangement protruding out from the back again, meaning it's not going to get away the cables in the middle of the case. So another thing to point out about our power supply bracket, it has these little cable clips here where you can use a cable tie to manage the cables coming down from your motherboard and your graphics card at the back of the case. This bracket is removable. It is optional because you can just simply insert your power supply in from the side. Otherwise, you can remove this bracket and attach it to the back of your power supply. So there's two screws at the back and two screws at the side to remove. And with the screws removed, we can simply remove the bracket. Last thing I want to do is show you how to reverse the case, which you'll find particularly useful. You want to put the PC on the left-hand side of your desk or just want to have a completely different looking build. So we've already removed a lot of the panels and brackets that we're going to need to do, but there is a few extra ones we're going to need to remove. 
So on the top of the case, we've got this panel here. It's held on with a thumb screw at the back. And once the thumb screw is removed, we can slide the panel backwards and lift away. On the bottom of the case, I just want to pull all our I.O. cables through. We've then got two thumb screws at the bottom we need to loosen. This is then going to allow us to slide our case forward and lift it up and remove it from the bottom of the case. Next, we need to remove our power supply support bracket from the bottom of the case. And it's held on with three screws underneath the case. And with the three screws removed, the bracket is free to lift off. If we turn the case around, we're going to want to remove the bracket up to the top of the case. You can see we've got two holes here for it. So we can set the bracket into place. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to put our third screw in here, but it's going to be fine with two screws holding it in place. Now what we're going to want to do is swap our hard drive cage and power supply around. You'll see I've already removed the power supply bracket, so we need to remove our hard drive cage. It's removed in a similar way, two screws at the back and two screws at the side. So I'm just going to move the hard drive cage down to the bottom. And then we can move our power supply bracket up to the top. We can then put our bottom panel onto the top of the case and slide it into place and tighten up the two thumb screws at the back. So previously our I.O. cables went down through this hole here, but that is now into the main body of the case. So we're going to need to remove our dust filter and you'll see it's this hole that goes into the second compartment now. So we just need to free this clip up. We can move it over to this hole here, just tidy up our cables and then pass our cables through to the second compartment. So now rather than going on this way, we're going to flip our dust filter around, slide it onto the cables, and it's going to go just here. We can replace our top panel and secure it at the back with a thumb screw. We can set our top bracket into place, and also our top panel. And then we can replace our fan brackets. And this is then what the case looks like in the reverse mode. Now the big advantage of this is if you're going to have this sitting on the left hand side of the desk, you're going to be able to look into the tempered glass panel and see your build. I've gone ahead and removed the panels again to orientate you in the case. So your motherboard is going to go here upside down. We've got our PCI expansion slots here. So your graphics card horizontally will go across here with the fans facing up the way, so also inverted. You're still going to have fan mounting at the bottom, at the top and at the side. And if you want to mount your graphics card upright, you can still do this at the side as well. And if we take a look at the back, again, because we have reversed our power supply and hard drive cage, power supply still at the bottom, hard drive cage still at the top, we've got cable management in the middle, and we've still got our fan bracket towards the front of the case. So you can definitely come up with a really cool build at no extra cost just by simply reversing the case, but that's going to be a project for another day. Um, I've done a previous build in the reverse mode in the original O11 Dynamic Evo, and I'll put a link to that video in the description. But what I'm going to do now is put the case back to its standard configuration and get on with the build. We're now ready to start working on our motherboard, and we're going to be installing our CPU, our M.2 SSD, and our RAM before we put the motherboard into the case. We can open our socket cover by pushing this lever down and out to bring it all the way to the middle of the motherboard, and then we're going to be able to open the socket cover up. We can then lower our CPU down into the socket, making sure we've got the text the correct way round. And once we're happy, our CPU is sitting correctly at the socket, we can close the socket cover down again. Then if we close the lever, the black bit of plastic will pop off and we'll put it in our motherboard box for safekeeping. We're going to install our Rainbow 2 SSD in the top slot. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove the heatsink. If you're using the motherboard from new, there'll be some plastic protection on the bottom that you're going to need to remove. We can then set our drive into the socket flatten it down and close the little clip here to hold it in place. Again, if you're using the motherboard from new, there'll be plastic protection on the back here that you're going to need to remove. And then we can go ahead and replace our heatsink. We're going to be installing our RAM in the second and fourth slot along from the CPU. So we can go ahead and open the clips on these slots. Then we can lower our RAM down, line it up with a slot. Once we're happy, everything's lined up properly. It's just some firm pressure and it's going to clip into place. And then same thing with our second stick of RAM, line it up and some firm pressure. Next, we can set our motherboard into the case, line it up with the standoffs at the back. Once it gets through the middle standoff, that will help hold it in place. And then we can secure the motherboard to the case using seven of the screws with a little lip around the outside. 
and then we can screw in the standards for our GPU support bracket. And then we can set our GPU support bracket into place. The next thing to do is plug in our case cables. Our HD audio cable is going to go to this header down the bottom left hand side of the motherboard. So we can bring the cable through the cutout and we're going to have to plug it into the HD audio text facing up the way. We've got two ARGB headers down the bottom of the motherboard, so we'll bring our ARGB cable coming from our cases controller through, line it up with the header, and push into place. And Lee and Lee have organized all our front panel connectors into a single header. Um, it's gonna go into this header down the bottom left-hand side of the motherboard, and it's the pins over to the left-hand side that we're gonna to want to plug into. And we're gonna plug it in with the front panel text facing up the way. Our USB 3.0 cable is going to go into this header here, so we'll bring it through the cutout at the side, line it up, and push into place, and then pull the excess cable through to the back. Our front panel Type-C header is just above this, so we'll bring the cable through the cutout, line it up with the header, and push into place, and again, we'll just push all our excess cable through to the back. We are now ready to install our power supply, and it is a fully modular power supply coming without any of the cables plugged in. I've gone ahead and plugged in the cables that we're going to need. So down at the bottom, I've plugged in our 24-pin cable. I've plugged in two 8-pin EPS cables to provide additional power to our CPU. I've plugged in our 12-volt high power cable to power our RTX 4080. I've also plugged in a PCIe cable. We're going to need this to actually power our fan hub for our Li Li Uni fans. And I've also plugged in a SATA power cable because we're also going to set up power for our case and our AIO. So something important to point out about our power supply, it has a hybrid zero fan mode. So whenever the power supply is under low load, the fan will stop spinning, helping reduce noise in the build. And to turn it on, we want this button in the outer position. So I'm just going to push it in and that's going to bring it to the outer position, which means the hybrid fan mode is turned on. We can then set our power supply bracket onto our power supply and secure it into place with the four power supply screws. Next, we can set our power supply into the case and we'll secure it into place with the four screws. Our two 8-pin EPS cables are going to go into these headers at the top left of the motherboard, so we can go ahead and bring them through the cutout, line them up with the headers, and push into place. And we've got some cable combs on the cables to help organize them. Our 24-pin power cable is going to go into this header here, so we'll bring it through the cutout, line it up with the header and push into place. And again, we've got some cable combs on the cable to help organize it. Then at the back of the case, we've got the SATA cable coming from our case to plug into the SATA cable coming from our power supply. We're now ready to install our AIO and I'm going to point out its features while it's on the table because it's a bit easier to show you. So all our fans are already installed in the radiator and connected up together. Coming from our radiator, we've got two cables. First is a four pin PWM connector. And we've got two choices for this. We can plug it into our motherboard CPU fan header and let our motherboard control the fans in the radiator, or we can plug it into a cable coming from our pump, and that's going to allow Lian Li's L Connect to control the fans on the radiator, which is the option I'm going to go for. The other cable is a speed controller. It's two speeds, high and low. High is incredibly noisy, although it does give pretty good cooling. Um, I'm going to slide it over to the low setting, which gives great cooling and also great noise levels. Next thing to do is take a look at the cables coming from our pump. So first of all, we've got a USB cable, and we're going to need to plug that into a USB 2.0 header on our motherboard to allow Li and Li's L connect to control the lighting and also the pump speed. We've also got a four pin PWM connector. We're going to plug that into the pump header on our motherboard to allow our motherboard to control the pump speed. And we've also got a SATA power connector, and that is going to power our pump. If we take a look at the side on the top where the tubes are, we've got this little additional header with a double cable symbol. Into here, we want to plug this double cable in. Coming from it, we've got a four pin PWM header, and this was the header I was talking about. If we plug the fans on our radiator into here, the Leon Lee's L Connect is then going to be able to control the fans on the radiator. On the other end of this double splitter cable, we've got an ARGB cable. Um, two options for it, you can unplug it here, and if you have a device like Li and Li use, you can plug it directly into here. But there's also this little splitter cable, which has a 3-pin 5-volt ARGB connector. And if we plug anything into here, it's going to allow Li and Li's L Connect to control the lighting effects on it. On the other side of our pump, we've got this single cable here. And if we plug an additional cable that comes with our AIO into here, it's going to allow our motherboard to control the lighting on the pump itself. I'm definitely going to be using the Lee's L Connect to control it because it gives us much more control over everything. So it's going to look much tighter if I don't plug that cable in. But there is an additional cable you can plug into here and plug into an ARGB header on your motherboard if you want. Next thing to do is to slide our AMD brackets onto our pump. Just a matter of pushing them into place on one side. And 
and same again on the other side. We can then set our top fan bracket onto the radiator and we'll secure it into place with 12 of the short radiator screws. We can then set our AO into place at the top of the case and we'll secure the bracket into place with two screws. And then at this stage we can replace our case's top panel. I'm just going to pass the two cables on the radiator through to the back of the case and we can then add some thermal paste to the centre of the CPU. Next we're just going to set our pump into place. We're going to get the top clip over the bracket and then lower the bottom one down and try and get it over the bottom bracket. So that's both clips on and then I'm just going to tighten up the two thumb screws. And then we'll just give each a little turn with a screwdriver. If you're using the I.O. from new, remember to remove the plastic protection from the cold plate before securing your pump to the motherboard. And you've got three different options for customising the pump, giving it a different look. I have covered this in my full step-by-step -step guide to using this I.O. so I'm not going to repeat this today. I'm happy with the default appearance, but I'll put a link to the video in the description for you if you want to check that out. So next I'm just going to route all the cables coming from our pump through to the back. And then it's going to pass the PWM cable coming from our pump back through. And our pump header is this one towards the right of the motherboard at the top. So we'll line it up with the header, push into place, and then we'll just tuck all the excess cable through to the back. I'm going to route the USB cable coming from our pump through to the bottom of the case and plug it into one of the three USB 2.0 headers at the bottom. And we're going to plug it in with the USB text facing up the way. Then at the back of the case we've got the PWM cable coming from our fans to plug into the PWM cable coming from our pump. And the SATA cable coming from our pump, we can plug into the SATA cable coming from our power supply. So now we come on to the bit I've really been looking forward to. It's these new TL LCD fans. So I've got three of these 120mm fans with reverse flan blades to go on the side of the case set to intake. So you're familiar with Leon the Unifans, the process for joining these together is very similar to previous version. Just a matter of lining them up together like this and pushing into place. One new feature you'll notice with these fans is there is a screw covers to make them look a little bit tidier. You are able to get your nail into here to pull the little rubber pad off and that opens up the screw hole. So you'll notice the screw hole is actually recessed into the rubber pad. And the big advantage of this is if you've got 25mm fans with your I.O., which is the most common type, you are still going to be able to use the standard radiator screws to mount these fans, even though they are 28mm thick. And that's because the screw hole is actually recessed into the fan. So I'm just going to put the little rubber pad back into place. Now we've got one of the little connectors to go on to the fans. Just a matter of lining it up and pushing into place to secure it. Again, one of the new features that Leon Lee have got is it is possible to change the direction this cable comes off. If you wanted to go over to this side, just a matter of freeing it up here and then sliding it in under the little clip on the other side. Just taking care that you don't dislodge the cable as you do it. On the other side of the fans, we still are able to twist off these little connectors here. Just a matter of twisting them around and pulling them off. And that's going to give you a nice flat surface if you are mounting these on a radiator. In terms of connecting up the TL LCD fans, each controller can support up to a maximum of six of the LCD fans. So that's two groups of three into two different ports on the controller. And the controllers between the LCD and non-LCD TL fans work with each other. So you can mix and match the fans, but you can't actually join a non-LCD fan to one that has an LCD screen on it. They have to go into separate ports on the controller. So I've also got three non-LCD TL Uni fans and I've got the reverse versions of these and I'm going to be installing these down at the bottom set to intake. So you can see the main difference is there's no LCD screen in the middle of them. Um, the other difference that you'll notice is we've got these little plastic tabs on the side which we can push them down. And the idea behind these is these gold pins, they worry about you actually being able to get a short if they were to touch a metal part of your case. So on the end that you're not actually going to be putting a connector on, they recommend that you leave the plastic tab in place. So we'll go ahead and get these uni fans connected up. And onto the end we can take our connector, push it into place. And again, if we want to change the orientation of the cable, we can move it over to here. We're also going to be able to twist these little connectors off at the end. And what is important to mention, the cables are different between the LCD and non-LCD versions. So it is important to take care not to mix them up. And if you look closely down at the bottom of the fans, you'll see it says TL-LED. 
indicating that they are for the LED version of the fans. The, t the other ones say TLLCD, so it's important not to mix the cables up. So unlike the LCD versions of the fans where you're limited to three fans per port, you can actually plug 10 of the non-LCD fans to one port on the controller. To do that, you can daisy chain the fans together. There's this connecting cable that comes with the fan, so it's just a matter of pushing it into place, and then on here as well. And that's gonna allow you to group fans together. You might be worried about powering all 10 of the fans, and what Lee and Lee recommend, if you're powering more than six of these off one port, you should plug a SATA cable into the end of the fans. So we've got this additional cable, it's got a connector on one end and a SATA cable on the other, and it's just a matter of lining it up and then pushing it into place. And this should plug into a SATA cable coming from your power supply. But for us today, we're just gonna need three of these joined together with one cable coming from them. And then finally, I've got a forward-facing LCD fan for the rear of the case. And then we can secure our fans to the fan brackets. Next thing to do is install our Unifan controller, and as you can see, it's got one, two, three, four ports on it. Um, in terms of the cables coming from the ports, they're all plugged in already. So we've got a four pin PWM connector. We plug that into a PWM header on our motherboard. It's gonna allow us to have motherboard control. Similarly for the three pin five volt RGB connector, it's gonna allow us to use motherboard sync to control the lights on the fans. We're gonna to need to connect the USB cable to a USB 2.0 header on our motherboard. In terms of powering the hub, this time we've got a six pin PCIe cable rather than the older hubs that had SATA cables on them. So before we put our fans in down at the bottom, it does make sense to get the cables coming from our hub plugged in. So we've got a PWM connector here down the bottom of the motherboard, so I'll bring the PWM cable through, line it up with a header, and push into place. Next to it, we've got an ARGB header, so we'll line the cable up, push into place, and we'll pull the excess cable through to the back. We've got two spare USB 2.0 headers here, so I'm just gonna plug the USB cable coming from our hub into one of them. And at the back of the case, we need to plug a PCIe cable coming from our power supply into the PCIe cable coming from our hub. Just before we set our bottom fans into place, I'm just gonna feed the cable coming from them through to the back of the case. And then we can set the fans up and into place and secure them into place at the bottom with the thumb screw. We can set our side fans into place. And again, we'll just feed the cable through to the back of the case. And we can set a single fan into place at the rear and screw it in from the back. Then we just need to plug our fans into the controller. So I'm gonna plug our bottom fans into port number one, our side fans into port number two, and our rear fan into port number three. We're now ready to install our graphics card, so we're gonna to need to remove the second and third slot cover from the top. On this motherboard, you don't actually need to open the slot to install the graphics card, but if you have a motherboard that has a clip on it, press the clip now to open it up. Then we can set our graphics card into place, line it up with the slot, and once we're happy everything's lined up, it's just some firm pressure and it's gonna clip into place. And then we can secure the graphics card into place with the two thumb screws we removed earlier on. Then we can bring our 12 volt high power cable through the cutout at the bottom, line it up with the graphics card, and push into place, making sure we get a nice click. And again, we've got some cable combs on the cable to help organize it. Then we need to slide the GPU support bracket up to where it supports our GPU. Okay, last thing to do is some cable management and get the panels back on again.
So that's the build complete and looking absolutely amazing. I think I underestimated just how much a difference the RGB lighting strip at the top and the bottom would actually make. And again, I just thought Leon Lee had released another Leon Lee uni fan, but these new TL uni fans and also the TL LCD uni fans are absolutely game changing. The lighting effects on them look incredible and the LCD screens really are completely game changing to how you build your PC. I am gonna cover the setup of these at the end of this video. But what I wanted to say now was um, I'm not going to cover the whole setting up of this PC. The reason for that is I've done a previous build guide using this motherboard and the setup is going to be very, very similar. So I'll put a link to that video in the description. If you don't know how to install Windows, the drivers, adjust all the RGB software, enter the BAS, update the BAS and adjust all the BAS settings, that covers everything. The only additional thing to mention with this video, because with this particular I.O. we don't have anything plugged into our CPU fan header, I did keep getting an error every time I tried to turn the PC on and it wouldn't actually boot into Windows. All I had to do was go into the BIOS in the advanced setting in the monitor section and turn the CPU fan speed monitoring to ignore. And after that, the PC worked flawlessly. So what I'm gonna do now is some thermal testing. I don't think I'm gonna do lots of detailed configurations. I've done that already with the original O11 Dynamic Evo and I'll put a link to that in the video in the description if you wanna find more about laying out your components to get the best in terms of thermals. There's not a big update to this case in terms of airflow. It's mostly focused on a few build quality issues and also aesthetics and Lee and Lee have made definitely some big improvements here. Um, what I will do is do some thermal testing of this particular build and I'll cover that in the case review which I'm just heading on to do now. So I will put a link to that video in the description. If you have enjoyed this video please remember to give it a thumbs up and if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. And what I'll do is I'll leave you with a guide to setting up the TL LCD fans and also to control the lighting on this case with the case buttons. So to control our fans in our I.O., we're going to need to download Lian Lee's L Connect. You're going to go ahead and download and install it. And when you open it up, you're going to have your system information displayed. Now this is a beta version of the software. Our AIO isn't showing up in it. It's just for the fans. Um, when you get the version that releases on the day the fans are available, it will be able to control both your AIO and your fans. So I'm not gonna be able to show you the AIO setup today, but I have done that in a previous video and I'll put a link to that video in the description if you want to know how to set up and control your AIO. And today I'm just gonna focus on our fans. So when you load up Leon Lee's L Connect, you've got all our system information being displayed here. And there's two different things to set up. There's the lighting on the fans and also the display on the LCD screen, if the fans have that. And the other thing is the fan control in terms of speed and settings. So we'll make a start with the fan control first of all. Okay, so we've opened this up, we can see our three groups of fans. We don't have anything plugged into channel number four. Into channel one, it's the non-LCD fans at the bottom, which is recognized and our two LCD fans are into channel two and channel number three. So we click on channel one, we can see it's running off the standard fan and curves reacting to the CPU temperature, which is currently 38 degrees. That's our current fan speed, and it's the 120 millimeter um, size of fans. We can adjust things over here, very similar to what we did with the previous uni fans. So if you want to go with a quiet fan profile, it's gonna change the curve. Um, if we want to add the start stop mode in, you'll see here, below a certain speed the fans don't spin at all and then only kick up after that. Or if we want to have it reacting to the GPU temperature because these are the fans at the bottom, we can do that. And we can also make our own fan curves. To save it to this fan, we would just click apply. To save it to all the fans, we would click apply to all. Um, I'm planning on doing some thermal testing and I want all the fans running in their stock settings before I do that. So I'm just gonna leave them at stock. The other option we have, we want to sync the fans up to our motherboard because we have plugged that PWM cable in. All we need to do is turn this on. This will disable the fan profile here and it will just run off the standard motherboard fan curves and you can see our fan speed has changed here. Again, if we want to control the LCD fans, it's exactly the same settings that we have here. Okay, so moving over to take a look at our lighting, it's the TL fan utility that we're going to want to go to. Um, we can see our fans are currently set to rainbow. And one of the nice things it's now doing is it seems to pick up the number of fans that are in each group. So you can see group one is the fans at the bottom. We've got three of them. Group two are LCD fans on the side. There's three of them. And then if we click on group number three, that's our rear fan. 
and there's only one of them. So previously in the Unleashed L Connect, you had to set the number of the fans up. So it's nice that this is being done for you. So we can see at the moment our fans are currently set to rainbow and adjusting the colors of the fans is exactly the same as what you would have done previously. You've control over the different aspects of the fans and you've all these different effects. So if I click on runway and click on apply, you'll notice that our fans at the bottom have changed to runway with these particular colors. And if I wanna change the colors, it's just a matter of clicking on the color that I want and painting it into these two colors at the bottom. If I want to apply this to all the fans, it's easy. You just click apply to the, and select the controller and click apply. And you'll notice that now all the fans in our case will have changed to runway with these current colors. So you can experiment with all these different colors. I think for me, I'm just gonna go with a static color. And I'm happy with the red and blue. So I'm just gonna click apply to all and click apply. And that's the fans in terms of the colors set up just the way I want them. So while we're currently on the non-LCD fans, we don't really have any other options. We can, we can of course pick our fan profile from here or the lighting effects but that's what these fans are limited to. If we select a group of our LCD fans, we do have a few different options here. So we have our LCD screen, which we can set up. So I'm gonna head and click on it. And you can see at the moment, it is the Lian Li logo. But if we look in our build, the Lian Li logo is currently round the wrong way. So we do have this little button here that we can press. And that's turned the fan now around the right way. If we want to, if it wasn't still right, we can keep rotating it. So I'm just going to rotate them all around. And then if we go over to our rear fan and rotate it round as well. So now that we've got all our fans around the right way, we can customize what comes up on the fans and we've got a number of different options. So we can have pictures, we can have a GIF, we can have an MP4, or we can have them as sensor panels. So we've shown you one of the pictures, which is loaded in as default. What we can do is add our own picture. So I'm gonna click on add. Um, I have uploaded my logo to the pictures. I can click on the logo and click on open. So you'll notice that my logo is now appearing on our top side fan. And what we can do is we can customize each of these fans differently. So you can have the logo appearing on Pacific fans or you can sync them to them all. So if I want the logo to appear on all the fans um, or two of them, if I wanted to appear in two, I can select another one select the logo and that's going to have my two fans as my logo and the Andy logo in between or what I can do is sync them to all by clicking here and you'll notice that the logo has now appeared on all the fans. The only one it hasn't appeared on is our rear fan and that's because you're going to have to set up the groups separately so we can click on the logo so going back to a group of three fans so that's a picture you can add whatever you want and have a different picture in each of the fans and have full control over it. Um, we can also do a video. Um, I don't have any GIFs saved, but we'll go to an MP4 and you're gonna add your video as well. So let's start off with my uh, intro. So we'll click on it. And it's gonna take a wee while just uploading it to the fans and then it's gonna start playing on the fan. Again, if you wanna sync that to all the fans, just click sync to all LCD and you'll notice it'll now start playing on that whole group of fans. We can take it a step further and we can actually have a, a video plan. So here's a video of my Lian Li O11 Vision build. So we'll click on it and click on open. Again, it's a bigger file, so it's gonna take a little bit longer to upload. And then now you've got the video appearing in the individual fan. So another really cool option is the sensor panel. So we select the fan that we want to change. Um, so we can have that as our CPU temperature. And again, we have different styles that we can pick. So it's currently style one. We can change the text color if we want the text color of each of the items to be different, we can do that. So let's pick the end one. Let's paint it in as a red. And you notice the text below the um, temperature has changed to red. Um, I think it actually looked quite good as white. So we'll put it back to white. And the sensor color itself, it's currently a blue. So again, we can change that to something different if we want, let's pick a purple. And there's different styles as well. So I can click on style two, for example, and that has everything set to blue. And um, if you don't like that again, go in and change the text. So let's paint it in as white. So I think actually style one looked the best. And this is obviously a beta version. Whenever I go back to it, it seems to always change the color back to blue for everything. 
Um, I imagine by the time it releases, they'll have these issues ironed out. Okay, so we've got one fan, that's a CPU temperature. Let's go down to the next one. Let's make it a GPU temperature. And if we go down to the third one, we've got a few different things. We could do a CPU load, GPU load, or a fan rev per minute. And that's gonna be of the fan that's currently being displayed. So let's go for CPU load. And then if we wanna to go to our rear fan, select the screen, and we'll go for it for GPU load. So what I want to do now is give you a look at how to control the lighting on the case. So this is the RGB light strip that runs along the top and on the bottom. Unfortunately, there's no way to control anything in the case with the buttons on the case. It's just this LED light strip. So the bottom button is brightness. At the moment, the brightness is set to 100%. If I press it again, it's gonna go down to 75%. Press it again, it's gonna to go to 50%. Press it again, 25%. And press it again, it's gonna go off. And again, we're back on at 100%. Next button above that is the color. So I'm currently in a pure color mode. To enter the pure color mode, you hold the color button in. And because I'm in it, pressing it, it takes me out of the pure color mode. And you're going to see we're going to get into this multicolor mode. So I'm going to hold the color button in again. And just hold it in for three seconds and that takes us into the pure color mode. So if I press it, we're gonna cycle through the range of individual colors that we have. And hold the button in. cycle through the multicolor mode that we have and again this would go very well with the theme that I've actually got set in the case. Above this we've got the mode button there's up and down just to cycle through the various mode functions so I'll go down the way and just show you all the different effects that we have. Now some of these you are going to be able to adjust the colour, so in this particular one if I press the colour button we are going to be able to change the colour of that individual effect. Obviously a lot of these have more rainbow type effects and you're not going to be able to adjust the colour, so I'm going to just keep them down the road. And again, this is currently set to white, and this looks like the one we're going to be able to adjust the color on. So pressing the color button here, we're going to be able to change the colors, but keep the same effect. If we want to sync everything up with our motherboard, we just need to hold one of the mode buttons in for three seconds. I've got the motherboard currently set to red, and that changes our lighting back to motherboard sync, which is currently set to red. To get off that again, it's just a matter of holding the mode button in again for three seconds, and we're going to be back to case control.